Hello, JW here, and today we're going to be looking at this clever wiring system which is designed to allow plumbers to do complex electrical tasks without setting fire to people's houses. In reality, this is actually exactly the same. You know, I should have checked that beforehand. I should have seen if John Ward's already featured this. I don't really know if he has. Yeah, he does uh, heating videos, I know that. Uh, so this is a Honeywell Sundial Plan Wiring Centre. And these can be got, uh, they're quite common in the UK, they can be bought for around about the £20 mark and they're worth every penny because they make the wiring of heating systems really easy. And if you consider that Honeywell were quite uh, instrumental in development of things like the three-port valve and the integration of components that allowed a very small number of components to control all the heating, then... It, it meant that there was a compromise to that and, uh, you know, it makes things a bit complex because this uh, valve, although it's got three positions, it only has one motor and uh, you put the, by applying power in various combinations onto these wires, it goes to the different positions. I shall show you that afterwards. I shall strip this apart and we shall reverse engineer it. But in the meantime, let's take a look at this because you don't have to know anything about the heating system at all to wire this. Instead of the horror that used to be a strip of terminal block inside a junction box with just a dog's dinner of wires just everywhere inside, just crushed in, and then the lid put on, what you have here is a situation you just don't need to know anything like that. You All you need to know is the type of system you're going to be using, cut the links to match, and then, well, mains. Live, neutral, and earth. Let me zoom down a bit in this so you can actually see. So uh, you've got your mains terminal, live, neutral, and earth. We've got a fuse, which is quite good. We've got the mid-position valve, and this can accommodate a couple of different types of valve. And all you need to know is that the colours of the wires are white, orange, grey, earth, and blue. And you just put them into appropriate marked terminals. You've got the pump, live, earth, and neutral. You've got the boiler, which is the live, neutral, and earth. Plus it's got the uh, SL, which is the control uh, live input. And you've got the pump overrun input. You get the programmer, which uh, you just stuff it in, room stat, stuff it in, cylinder stat for the water heater. All you have to do is put the wires in and connect your stuff up to it and the job is done. It's very clever. So I can see big thick tracks in the back of this. I'm wondering how they managed to do it without other links other than the control system links here. Uh, so I'm going to actually pop this out. I'm going to pause momentarily while I drill out these rivets and we'll take a look. And after that, I shall pop this open. So uh, one moment, please. I'm just going to go and get the drill and open this. The job is done. But before looking at that, uh, looking at this, it's really notable that they've put a lot of thought into the minimising of the instructions here. It really is quite a... It's a very clever system. It's almost like a huge complex puzzle. But anyway, let's get that out of the way. Let's bring the circuit board in and brighten this image up so that we can actually take a look. So the tracks, I have to say, maybe it's just me because I was used to uh, designing stuff with higher currents. I think I'd have chosen thicker tracks, but there is that compromise there that you have to allow for the fact that uh, you need good separation. and. Also, the the same applies to the pads for the terminal block. I would have gone for bigger pads. I would have sacrificed that spacing between them, which is not great news in, in a damp area. But um, it allows for the terminals on the back to, you know, get a much better, bigger solder joint. So that when they're being tightened up, um, it doesn't uh, actually... That's more visible that way, isn't it? When they're being tightened up, it doesn't actually sort of stress the solder joints at the back. Yeah, that's neat. I quite like that. It looks like someone has like got the schematic and they've spent a lot of time working out where these blocks would go and how they could connect together without any links other than the, the actual the programming links. That is a very, very neat design. I like that. Such a clever... I wonder who came up with that idea. It's good. It's very good. But anyway, the next part of this video is going to be about the three-way valve. And we'll take it to bits. Um, and I'll show you how it works. But uh, I'm going to connect it up first and I'm going to show you what actually happens inside this. So let me uh, get a better focus on this for a start. Let's bring something into... Uh, get it to focus on something out of the way I'll just focus on that and I'll tame this down that's working better targets for cameras to look at 
And I'll try and let you see what's happening down here because down here, let's see if we can actually do this. Let's see if we can zoom in and actually see. Yes, you can see the, the valve there. So this is a three-way valve. The water comes in via this inlet and gets diverted either out the A, the B, or out of both of them. By default, it will be blocking A, which is doing the radiators, and the water would, uh, if this wasn't powered at all, the water would be flowing to the uh, the hot water tank to heat it. And the sort of the it's the system is designed into two divided into two sections in the old Y plan. It's got the hot water tank um, control system, which effectively has its own control over the boiler. When it needs hot water to heat the water tank, it will just turn the boiler on and it, it just ignores the whole rest of the system if it's not needed. Um, but when it is needed, then there's a clever thing that goes on to actually allow this diverter valve to share the water between the hot water tank and the radiators. So I'm going to get the quick test up. I'm also going to get the hoppy. I'm going to get the hoppy in here. And I shall show you what happens when this thing is used. So the quick test, the cliff quick test is now connected up. I shall untie the cable. The well seasoned cliff quick test. I've had so much use out of this. It's unbelievable. And I'm going to hook this up. But I'm also going to be careful because I, I'm going to put a bit of tape over um, this wire here. Let's use a bit of this GLC PCB tape, not a sponsor, just to cap that wire off because it does become live. It's not live initially, but it does become live because it's actually the control back to the boiler to tell it to switch on. Let's uh, get this off. I'm not sure how good this will be since it's just a generic free tape. I would guess it's normal insulation tape made to the very finest Chinese standards. Into the bin with that. And I shall peel a bit of this tape up. Hopefully it is proper insulating tape. Not that it really matters. This is just a temporary thing. It'll do. Just nip that and put that over there. And I shall cap this orange wire like that. Just so I don't touch it. And get a zap. Uh, so now I'm going to put the blue wire, the neutral, into here. I'm going to put the earth wire into here and then I've got a choice. If I put the white wire in on its own, it should go to the mid position and I'll show you that. So I'll tilt this up and we'll, we'll check the hoppy afterwards. But right now uh, I'm going to fold that wire out the way and I'm going to zoom down in this. Put the light in and you can see the little rubber deflector there. If I power it up, that is slowly winding to a semi-mid position and then it cuts off, allowing water to flow both ways. And it's notable that it's uh, left a wider gap at this side, which feeds the radiators versus that side, which uh, feeds the hot water tank simply because less water would be required. You know, it's, the water would be better shared with most going out to the radiators. Um, when I power off, it returns under spring pressure. And it's worth mentioning this wouldn't handle like mains water pressure. It's, it's really just a diverter valve. It's going to leak water past if there's any sort of pressure. So now I'm going to uh, put the grey wire in as well as the white. And this time it should, if I illuminate this, when I close this across, It should go all the way. And the motor at the end literally just stalls and sits there in a stalled state, but it's quite a low power motor. So it's gone all the way across and now it's uh, blocked the hot water to the tank and now all the water will be flowing through the radiators. Okay, right, let's take this to bits and see how this works. Hear that noise it's, uh, as it revs. Oh, there's nothing I could show you. There is a, an override uh, mechanism in the side. If I power it up, you'll see that right across. Slight delay. Have I, have I screwed up here? Probably. 
Maybe it, maybe it is actually going to cross in the side. Oh no, I think it is. I thought that might have moved across. Oh, it is, it's loose, that's why. But uh, this is an override uh, that you can use to put it into a mid position. Let me just uh, turn this off. So you'll see that go back, but you can actually physically override the valve by pushing this up. And you hear the motor running, pulling it down, let it go back, and it latches. Oh, it, it, you have to, there's a sort of overrun the motor. So I'll just hold that in there for a moment until it's settled down. And that means you could actually override the valve with the power off. But watch what happens when you power the valve up again. It automatically um, releases itself to go into automatic mode again. Rightio, let's open it. Actually, before we open it, I should bring in the hoppy, shouldn't I? That was most remiss. That was most remiss. So uh, we'll monitor the power. So this is going halfway. And the power is... It's running at about 7 watts. And the valve is currently running up to that mid-position. Slight click. And then the power drops to 3 watts. Power factor is about 0.89, which is odd given what's actually happening here. If I uh, undo this, the valve returns under spring pressure to its normal position. And I put that in there and I power it. It's drawing the 7 watts and it's running up to the end and it's stalling. And there's actually a tiny, there's a fluctuation of power, but this motor in here is now stalled at the end of travel, but it's still drawing about 7 watts. Uh, one of the most common failures in these is the motor's burning out after, you know, a long period of time. But um, power factor at 0.75. Interesting stuff. Let's open it. Because it achieves uh, control in some clever ways that was, as I say, cost optimised when Honeywell were coming up with the system in the first place. I think it was them who did it. So, first of all, to service this, you can just generally clip the top off. And what you're left here is the diverter valve with its little stem uh, with it. It's keyed so it can only go on one direction and you can flop that backwards and forwards. Uh, this unit then has a screw that comes out at this side to reveal inside the motor. Uh, Sam Wu motor. And it's a standard synchronous motor. Um, you can get replacement motors for these, but um, sometimes it's better just to change the whole head if you, it will save time. So let's uh, start taking this to bits. We'll take this screw out. It is a minimalist design, as these things usually are. So we'll take this screw out. Uh, is this uh, focused down correct? Yes, it is actually. It should be. And we'll take this screw out. That also doubles as a connection for the earth wire, not just to the motor, but to the case itself. And then the motor on its little plate lifts off. Things worthy of note with these, they, the motor itself has a screw that goes through here, but the other side of the motor actually just basically goes under, hooks under a little metal tab there. It's very cost optimised. Very odd. We have the circuit board and we have a fan gear, I think that's called. It's a, a partial gear that, that uh, the motor drives onto. And that is quite heavily spring-loaded. But that spring in here, yeah, that's the little override lever, which I'll just pull out in fact. But uh, that gear is uh, the one that actually operates the valve. And uh, it also has cams on it that activate these two switches. Uh, the circuit board in here, it's quite clever. It's a, a very neat design. They have little plastic catches. And if you hook a screwdriver under either side of the switches, 
it's actually latched. The circuit board is just physically clipped. It's, it's aligned with the holes through the micro switches, but it's actually latched onto the gap between the two micro switches that locks it down into position when you push it in. That's quite neat. And here's the circuit board. So I shall zoom down this a bit so you can see it. Actually, you know what? I could just do the usual, couldn't I? I could take a picture of this and reverse engineer it and we could take a look at the circuitry. But here are the two micro switches. There's a stack of resistors there that are for a reason in a diode. And that is fundamentally two position switches, one for the mid position, one for end of travel. Um, and that's it. So if you give me a moment, I'm just going to uh, take a picture of this and then we shall reverse engineer it. One moment, please. The circuitry has been reverse engineered. I also took the valve apart to show you the little flapper inside that can rock backwards and forwards, very small amount of movement, and it simply goes between these two little pipes in here that are very close together. It really is just, it's not like, as I say, it's not like a mains pressure water valve. It really is just a little diverter that is gently blocking each side or going into the middle. Very neat. I guess that this will have O-rings inside and it's been pushed through from the, that side and then locked in with this uh, circle up on the outside. And then this, uh, when it's pushed in and held in by these uh, four screws, there's no ring here to actually uh, make a seal onto that as well. All very neat. But let's look down now onto the bit that's interesting, the circuit board. And I'm going to take a look at another look at this circuit board because uh, I realised it's one of the most complex bits of all. The earth connection goes to this terminal and this one it basically the earth terminal goes to every single connection so that meant that they've had to uh, zigzag it so it's come across from here and then it's zigzagged in these terminals and then gone down to that one and over to that one and zigzagged about it's really quite clever how they've done this it's very neat that would been that would have been one of the biggest parts of the puzzle and then working out how the other ones would connect and which terminal would go where. There was a lot of work in this. That took a long time. It must have. So the circuit board itself uh, is a double-sided circuit board. There's not really an awful lot in the back. This heat sink fin for these resistors. The resistors are 270 and two zeros. So that is... 270 and 20 27k, but there's four of them in parallel, so divided by four gives 6750 ohms for the resistor total. I'm not sure how hot those will get, they certainly added lots of uh, heat sinking there. Things worthy of note this wire here, although it's blue, the one that's going out to the motor is actually at the live to the motor. And there's a standard little one amp M7 diode, uh, rated about a thousand volts, and then a couple of switches, that is it. I've drawn on the uh, layout in the back of the contacts, like normally closed, normally open, and uh, the common here. But the circuit diagram looks like this. I shall zoom down on it. And then I shall try and not get my head twisted in a knot trying to explain this. So there's two control signals. There's the white. It goes live when it's wanting to... Uh, run water around the radiators. I'm just going to actually make sure this is in focus. Yes, it is in focus. The grey is odd. It's from the hot water system, but it's live when the hot water is not needed. So uh, there's a changeover switch in the uh, thermostat for the hot water that basically it's either enabling the, uh, the hot water heating or it's actually... Uh, when it's off, it's actually sending the live signal to here. And there's a reason for that. It's quite neat. So, if the hot water was off, uh, this would be live. And it then this went live to actually call the radiators. So both these would be live. And what would happen is that the power would initially go up this contact here. And it would go straight to the motor and the motor would run until it got to the mid position and this switch would change over. But because the water was off and there was therefore live, it would uh, then power the motor from there and it would run right up to the end. And that would close the uh, water heater valve completely. And when it went up to the end and hit, the, hit this end limit switch, this contact would change over to the orange, which is the boiler control, because the 
it's a shared connection, the orange, uh, the border control input, SL. Um, it means that either the radiators can actually turn the boiler on or the actual hot water system can turn it on. They're both a common connection. However, when it actually needs both, the hot water is connection is off because it is demanding hot water and the radiators are on, what actually happens there is that because this connection is off, the power initially goes up through this connection and the motor winds to the halfway position when this switch changes over. Uh, there, this isn't live, so it doesn't continue any further, but the power still gets to it via this switch, via the diode and that cluster of four resistors, which then locks the motor in that position. It's very, very Neat. If you do a search online for Y plan heating, now I don't know, is this a strictly a UK thing or or is it global? Um but there's different systems. This was the earliest one which just basically had one whole heating zone for the house and one hot water section. Modern systems will tend to actually device divide the house into multiple sections and are kind of simpler valves. Uh, just the it's just a one way port valve uh, two port valve as opposed to three port. It's not diverting either way. Uh, that is it. So things we can learn from this, I suppose, ultimately. Uh, this reminds me of the marshalling boxes also used for lighting these days. In many modern office buildings, if you go into a room, there'll be a, a box above the ceiling which might contain a network uh, node. But um, it's for the lighting and ultimately when the electricians run the power in, they run power to that box. They connect it to a connector and just plug it into it. And then when they put the switch in the wall, it just also plugs into another connector and the pass infrared or radar Doppler detector plugs into another connector. And then all the lights, it's got a row of the connectors that lights in the room can plug into those. And it means that if they, that when they finish the installation, they can test it by just unplugging sections to test. Or if something goes wrong, the building management maintenance guy can just literally unplug a light and plug a new one in or a pass infrared detector or whatever. It makes it very modular. So there's a lot to be said for these marshalling boxes. Um, so I wonder uh, what the history of this one is. I'd love to know who designed it and, you know, how much work was involved in doing that. It's very nice. It's a very neat approach for a very complex wiring system. And as I say, you know, if you are wiring up stuff like this in the UK, one of these units, if you buy one from Screwfix, if, if I think Screwfix or the heating companies, they'll save you an awful lot of time. Um, it also makes troubleshooting very easy as well because it's so open and exposed and everything's so well marked that you can go straight to a connection of the meter. So well worth taking apart. Very neat inside. And uh, also worth taking this valve apart, this uh, motorised drive system. Very simple, just using that one cheap synchronous geared motor um, and just running it in that way that they could actually stop it in different positions uh, with the minimum amount of electrics. Very interesting, very neatly done.